that statement. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And I'm AY. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. We're going to do something fun this time, something with a little bit more. We are going to be fun. Last time we had AY on, we talked about uh, the Race Together campaign, but this time we're going to talk about yarn. Yarn comes from sheet. No, I'm kidding. We're going to talk about grad school. Yes. Turns out there are things that make me smile and things that I like, so... One of them is yarn. But, See? Well, yeah, we want to do this because, uh, AY, you've had some wonderful news recently. What's your mm-hmm. wonderful news? Um, I have been accepted into the um, PhD program in philosophy at the University of Washington at Seattle. Ah, yay! Um, it was one of my top choice schools, um, and so... I'm going to be moving to Seattle in September, and I'm so excited. In which case, you will have to digitally commute to be in the podcast. Yes, yeah. yes, that's okay, we'll though. Happen, though. Um, I believe that there are like ways in which you can actually connect one computer to another over long distances in order to share information. Oh, my God. So we'll have to figure out how to like make we'll that happen. It. We'll work on yeah. it. It's, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it'll be fine. So we're going to talk about grad school and give you some advice. Like, for instance, everything I learned from Twilight is it's going to be rainy where you're going. It's so you should get a good umbrella. Yes. And I've already visited the city, and it rained every single <laughs> day that I was there. So see, Every day. The interesting thing, Ryan, is your education on Seattle comes from Twilight, and yep. my education on Seattle comes from Shadowrun, so this is going to be pretty screwed up. Well, and my education so, on Seattle comes from having visited there, so So, so tell basically, me all your you're an authority. Twilight and the little bit of time where grunge became a thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That was a of, thing. We're a lot of plat. Yeah. We're a lot of plat. Yeah. Um, no, no. Ice, icebreaker is why go to grad school? Why bother? Why do it? Uh, I can't say why everybody should go to grad school. I know I went to grad school because I just I wasn't ready to go into the real world. It was high school all over again. I, wasn't, I did a fifth year at, in high school because I wasn't ready to move on. And then I realized that I had outgrown that pond and it was time to move on. <laughs> and when it came to grad school, I finished my four years and realized I wasn't ready for the outside world. You know, it was, it was kind of a big, scary place. So I did grad school and realized I wasn't an academic, but I still learned something. So mm. uh, I say go to grad school because you meet great people and you get exposed to different ideas. Especially go to grad school, I would say... I liked going to UW for my grad studies, but there's a part of me that wishes I had gone elsewhere just to just to expose myself to something new. Mm. But that's why I say to go is is to expose yourself. Just to hermit yourself away from the real world and expose yourself to different things. Yeah. Hey, what? Hey, kids! <laughs> I also did a motion of opening up my jacket, and exposing myself. <laughs> it's um, okay. She's not wearing a jacket. <laughs> I am going to grad school because I want to get a PhD in philosophy. Um, I grew up in a family that always expected me to go to university, um, ex- always expected me to go to grad school, um, and so I think from a very young age I always saw myself as an academic, and then it was a very happy accident that I also enjoyed academia. Um, and I love research, I love reading philosophy, and I want to write my own philosophy and produce a substantial body of work in philosophical theory, and so that's why I'm going to grad school. Um, If there's any kind of career that I'm going to be doing afterwards, I know that I want it to be heavily theory-based, and so it's also, for me, in a lot of ways, career preparation. I just had a crushing realization. I was the kind of grad student that took the space away from somebody like you who deserved to go to grad school. I was there literally. <laughs> I was I'm literally you. taking up space from somebody who probably <laughs> would have did more with the academic opportunity. I feel terrible now. Now that you're existentially crushed. Yeah. Um, I think that you should go to grad school to put on your grown-up pants. One of the things I, I spent a bunch of my undergrad. Um, not understanding it. I, my, my, my family never expected me to go to university. I believe the set standard was don't go to jail. Um, which was a possibility for a, a while. But, no, going, going... I didn't know that about you. Well, you know, uh-huh. misspent youth. It wasn't that much of a possibility. Suggestion! <laughs> <laughs> one time! One time! One treasonous act and everybody gets all upset. <laughs> one time! People don't but, like to forget. 
No, it was, it was, I, I, I came out of it and one of the things I learned in grad school was I, it, it set me up for starting to treat my professors who I had been working for like colleagues mm. who, who I would be working with if I went onward. It also taught me that I did not want to go onward. Well, no, a good master's program teaches you whether or not you're ready for a PhD. And I, I've talked about it before. Uh, I talked about Jesse, my office mate, who was doing his PhD at Western. And he sat at the desk next to me and we had the exact same grad school experience except Everything that he did, he, he loved it and he threw himself into it. Mm -hmm. He learned a whole new kind of physics to do his thesis, which was amazing. He does philosophy of quantum mechanics. And I, on the other hand, was like, okay, if I write 19 pages, I can go back to doing what I'm doing, which was making YouTube videos, podcasting, uh, designing websites, doing tech support, running charity events, like all this other stuff that I was doing. And I was doing grad school in between those things. And what I, what I realized is, is that I am doing grad school in between those things. And if I go on to a PhD, that is not a level of commitment. Like I, it requires a great deal more commitment than I'm apparently willing to give it mm. because it is not what I really want to do. How horribly sober and mature of you. It was wonderful. But I mean, I mean <laughs> it was part of it was realizing that, 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 um, these people who I had, I had looked up to, um, for, for, you know, they, they, I always, I always talked about, uh, my profs as they're, they're the people I get to grow up and be. And, uh, Aww. they, uh, they're aware of that. Jim. But there is that, there was that notion where, um, I was never going to grow up and be them. I just had to start being them right away mm. because that was what they had to do. And it, were, and it was, it was neat to sort of, I, I think a good master's program will do that. It will teach you to sort of put on your grown up pants. And, and start stop thinking of yourself as a student and start thinking of yourself as a researcher. Mm. As someone mm. as someone capable of contributing to a field. Mm. And you're yeah, I mean in a master's program you're usually not, but you ideally grow to fill that role in a PhD. Mm. Mm. So yeah. So in a previous podcast, which will be over Huck's face or in the show notes for those of you listening. Uh, we talked about our philosophy stories because Huck and I both have master's degrees in philosophy, and uh, we. Ay has a bachelor's in philosophy. Ay has a bachelor's, but she just got accepted to a PhD program, which makes her cooler than us. I'll add one extra letter, like numerically. We have two. She yeah, it's three. true. Um, I'm actually gonna have five because I'll also put MA. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, we. Be in there too, might as well. Yeah. Seven. We. Um, <laughs> We talked about our philosophy stories and how we ended up studying philosophy. Um, and now that AY, you are here, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to hear your philosophy story, which we okay. deliberately didn't talk about in pre-show. Okay, okay, so this is a surprise for them too. Um, my philosophy story, I feel as though um, my philosophy story in a lot of ways comes full circle. So the, the current step in my philosophy story is that I'm going into um, my PhD program um, with the intention of producing something interesting that I could use as a stepping stone for a career as a researcher. Um, and when I, I think my philosophy story actually started when I was 13, when I became vegetarian. And that was 10 years ago. I'm so old. But, um... <laughs> we will never speak of age again on this podcast. I am the only vegetarian in my entire family, and when I say entire, I mean full extended family, um, all 50 cousins on my dad's side and all 100 and something on my mom's side. My family's huge. I'm the only vegetarian, and so when I made that choice, um, I had to defend it uh, dozens and dozens of times, and I think in a lot of ways that was my first experience with um, critical thinking over a coherent moral system. Um, and the reason I became vegetarian was because I was interested in environmental ethics and animal ethics. And so I actually started off my undergrad in um, environmental science, thinking that I was going to do research in carbon sequestration. I thought that I was going to develop the thing that would help solve global warming. Um, again, at that point, I intended to go to grad school and do a PhD. And then in my very first semester, I took environmental ethics, philosophy 220. <laughs> I don't know if they've changed the course code, but it was philosophy 220 that changed my entire life and ruined me because it was the first time I had a chance to really engage um, theoretically and 
theoretically in like a structured environment um, with the questions that I had been wondering for years and it was my first encounter with um, other people who cared about the underlying reasons mm -hmm. why we should do things beyond oh it's probably better than not doing them and I found that to be a liberatory practice it was exciting to read things that challenged me and to write about what those challenges were and not just write about the challenges but actually try to respond to the philosophers that was really cool and of course when you're in first year you think you know everything so I thought that <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I thought that I, I ran across some of my first year out. papers when I was following some stuff and they're embarrassing I thought I had it all figured out I was like this is amazing and so um, I changed my plan from wanting to do carbon sequestration research to wanting to do environmental ethics and change my major to philosophy and since then I've discovered whole new branches of philosophy that I love even more so that's my story now I want to get even deeper into them. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, that's not very like no, I mean, exciting. There was my, no big my, revelation. Ryan's was that he uh, didn't work out as an engineer, and mine was that one day my computer uh, power supply died. Oh, okay. So I mean, you're doing pretty well. No, okay. I mean, I mean, the the, the, the take is that <laughs> all philosophers are sort of fundamentally damaged in that once we once we sort of hit it, we can't not do it mm -hmm. ever, mm -hmm. and that becomes a problem. I mean, I guess worse is being a person who practices philosophy or <laughs> studies philosophy who can stop doing it, mm. which sort of seems deeply unfortunate, mm -hmm. at least to me. Also, the trauma of realizing that you can't ever not ask a question. Like, even if you don't vocalize it, the wonder it's there. is yeah, always yeah. in you're, your you're head. Like, you're like, but what if we... No, 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 don't even ask it, but you can't. You have to ask. Yep. The wonder is always burning at you. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Need some Valtrex for your philosophical brain. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think grad school's going to be like? I think it's going to be amazing. I think it's going to be significantly better than my undergrad. Not because my undergrad was bad, but because I think that grad school is going to allow me to do more of the things that I've loved about philosophy so far. Fair enough. So, and I get to teach. Mm. So excited to great. teach. Yeah. I'm not excited about that part. No. Honestly, <laughs> uh, honestly I will... I will break from our show notes for a moment to talk about grading. Okay. The I don't expect it to be a The pleasurable. super secret part of grading papers, which is actually one of the things I miss most about grad school, weirdly enough, mm -hmm. is grading papers is what makes a person a better scholar. Because mm -hmm. what you have are 30 instances mm -hmm. of the same argument mm -hmm. in front of you. Stated and you have wrongly. well no no but even if they're stated correctly um there 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 i mean there's only in any in any paper topic that you give out in like a first or a second year course in a third year course there's only going to be sort of a subset of papers that you get out of that if you're talking about you know consequentialism there's going to be the trolley problem papers there's mm -hmm. going to be the surgery papers there's going to be the who's jeremy bentham papers there's like there's there's going to be a sort of set of them and you have to fully appreciate the nuance of whatever that topic is in order to grade these things responsibly you have to i mean you have to you, i mean you can just throw them down the stairs and figure it out from there but that That's is what I'm gonna do. usually frowned upon and and the practice the practice of reading all these things and grading them responsibly uh, if you didn't understand the nuance at the beginning mm -hmm. you will certainly understand it at the end you'll be like no no it is impossible to talk about the trolley problem without talking about the ethics of lever pulling. Mm -hmm. You know, it is mm -hmm. it is it is not worthwhile to talk about deontology without talking about yeah. how you know say how it treats non sentience. You know, like animals and things like that, or or like there's all kinds of things where where you're like this this is this part of this of of this argument or this topic is essential. Why is it essential? And you have to justify it because mm -hmm. students will come to you and I'd be like, I didn't, you like, you didn't talk about this. They're like, why do I have to talk about this? Because I said so and I'm grading. But you're a philosophy professor and you can't do that. Like, Damn. sometimes it's, yeah, because it was part of the assignment. But sometimes mm -hmm. it's like, no, it's because this is an essential part of what you are talking about. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about Aristotelian virtue ethics without talking about the rule of the mean and the nature of human flourishing. Mm -hmm. Because if you try... You have missed 
a vital point. You know, you you can't talk about popsicles without talking about the pain in the ass bit where you gotta break the popsicle on whatever and it shatters into a million pieces you and no one gets any have popsicles. You terrible popsicle methodology. I have giant Hulk hands no, is what, what I have. No, what you do is you take the popsicle and you run it under like warm water to loosen it and then you pull the popsicle out because the way you do it, you might break the stick connection to the popsicle. No, actually now what I do is Bye. shatter it with a mighty karate chop. <laughs> I'm getting pretty good at it. You're never getting me a popsicle. Don't want to brag. You're never getting me a popsicle. If I offered you a popsicle, you would take it. I would throw it on the floor. Oh. And shatter it. And shatter it, then I pick it up. Then no one would have popsicles. I think one of my favorite parts about grading papers was relearning the material all over again. You know what? I probably did not understand Descartes until I had to grade philosophy 100 papers. Because at that point, if you don't understand Descartes, what are you doing? Well, it's just I, ref- I reflect back. So part of it is is like you have to get over. And I'm not saying like you do this, but one of the things, the first things I had to get over was the idea that um, there's definitely one right answer, which is not quite true, um, but that the students are stupid for not getting it because I reflected back in the first year and it's like I didn't understand any of this. I was grasping at straws trying to make heads or tails of it, and without fail. You're going to get a large, for example, with Descartes, you're going to get a large number of papers who misunderstand the point of why he's running this thought experiment, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people just. But what thought experiment for those who haven't, like, read Descartes? Just uh, the methodologically doubting a way of. You can find out more about Descartes in the show. Yeah, certain knowledge. Um, Most people, or at least a lot of the students that I graded, tend to take, like, think he was serious with Mm -hmm. these doubts. And it's like, oh, he, he was playing with us, you know, kind of deal. Um, so you get the papers where the, the students are being wrong. And then, so instead of grading it uh, as being wrong, I had to try to figure out a kind of economically valid way, not mon- monetarily, but my time-wise, of being mm. able to give them enough details in my car- comments in order for them to learn why it was wrong. So I couldn't mm. just say, no, zero. It is, you are missing this, this, this. It's kind of like what Jim was saying. Yeah. Like, you're missing these fundamental premises or these fundamental... Um, supporting pieces in order to in order to get the answer right and a lot i don't i got maybe one or two challenges and i graded probably five different courses mm. um well because i just kept asking for more more uh more papers to grade um and then i got better over time kind of deal it's like any other skill um, but i found it really rewarding going and relearning things or uh, even with um international justice i, I mm. ta for or end for one and i never taken i never taken international justice so learning it while I'm also grading it, dangerous secret to the students. Like, you know, I was learning it as as I was doing it. Um, it's okay. But it was it was really rewarding to be able to step back into fill one hundred or the the one the first level or first year of courses. I'm so excited. I mean, if it's my good. my my ideal career would be teaching intro Plato to, mm. to like high school students or students coming in for first year or at the local library and just rent out a room mm. and then do intro Plato. Not because I think Plato got it right, but I think Plato's a good place that you can start with the ideas. Mm, um, that's an interesting perspective. Just, just uh, you know, like he, Plato would have, I mean, Plato thought he was right when he was writing about the forms. Yeah, but you mm. could also, do is buy yourself a toga, <laughs> stand in the aggro, and just we do have quote a, play out people. We do have a speaker's corner. Shout at people. In, yeah. In Shout at people while they walk by. No, do what he did and like follow people around town. Yeah. And like demand that they tell you about their profession and then tell them why you believe they're wrong. Demand that they justify themselves to yeah, you. Yeah. Everything then they do. Drink the hemlock because it is better for me to <laughs> abide by the laws of the state than to run away. Yeah, nah, you're going to get punched before you get a chance to drink <laughs> yeah, the yeah, hemlock. Yeah, yeah. Someone will punch you. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, what was what was grad school like for you, Ryan? Uh, in a word, unprepared. Um, I don't think I've made it a secret that I am and was a terrible student. Uh, and I thought I was ready to go into grad school, and then I got to grad school and I saw the caliber of my peers and I saw the caliber of the work that I thought was expected of me, not the caliber of work that is actually expected. Like, so you think you're supposed to be 
every essay is supposed to be a publishable piece, right? As opposed to you just need to be. I don't know what you were right. writing. My work oh. is flawless. I was writing oh. terrible. But that's that's exactly <laughs> it. Is your, the caliber of the stuff that you're working on is probably flawless. <laughs> Mine was very flawed. Um, and so when I when I finished grad school, I realized that I didn't capitalize on the experience if I had mm. been prepared. Like I, it took three years for me to finish my master's degree. It took two years to finish my thesis. I applied to six grad schools for a PhD program. Burnt through six hundred dollars in or six hundred plus dollars plus the GRE plus the GRE. Uh, which I you know what I studied for like three days before and I actually scored fairly well seventieth percentile in. Uh, qualitative, 40th percentile, which is in quantitative, uh -huh. and like I scored the six or whatever on the written piece. You got a six on written? It was either 5.5 or six, like it was... Yeah, I know, I got 5.5, <laughs> <laughs> which burns All of me. a sudden, we have a we have our first podcast Oh viewed. my god. So, but I, but I realized... I aced that part, you got a six? I guess, I don't know, I'm just really Don't good. talk to me. I, I, wrote, I won an award for essay writing. I'm good at writing essays. Yeah, I also have won essay awards. I won it first. Right, so, Mr. So Powers. I won it first. I'm going to need you guys to put it away. Anyways, um, so I just realized that it was a good experience. I don't regret the experience because, like, you know, a lot of good things came out of it. I met my girlfriend. I met some interesting people. I got a lot of good skills that ended up translating into the job world. Um, I don't regret it, but... Knowing what I knew at the end, I really wish that I had a different mindset going in and I could have taken advantage of it more. Um, I could have learned more. Like, just the simple, like, sitting in the common area eating lunch with everybody, right? Uh, I didn't necessarily take advantage of that. I was across campus in the CRT office, which, you know, the campus response team office. It was good, but I should have, you know, spent time trying to learn more from Matt or trying to learn more from Shannon. Um, or even learning more from my peers, mm. taking in their example, like how studious Nora was. And, you know, she was, she was freaking smart, but she probably also put in a lot of work that I just didn't see in the background, mm. as opposed to joking around in our, our office. We were just a bunch of jokesters. Xander and Chris and I and, and uh, Rye. You know, we, it's not like we were working very hard over it. <laughs> Can I put an asterisk on sure. the job skills conversation? Because I'd love to talk about that some more, but I think yeah. we also have other things that we want to talk about. Yeah, we do. My, so my grad school experience was, um, the cool thing about grad school for me was that they gave me an office. I didn't have an, an office myself. I shared it with uh, four other people, uh, but only really one of who was ever there. It was Jesse. Um, and, but what it did was it gave me it, it gave me this feeling of autonomy. I mean, in, in university, you sort of, you either spend time in social spaces or you spend time at home or you spend time in the library working on stuff. And, but you're always sort of going back and forth. Like, you have a sort of routine. In grad school, I had X amount of things that I had to work on. And that was it. And those X amount of things were not very large. I think I had to write, I, I average, average, I had to read about, I don't know, seven books per term, and I had to write about 70 pages, which is not a lot for a human being getting a master's degree in the humanities. Like that's, that's reasonable. And I'm probably actually overestimating that a little bit. But, because so I was just, you know, it didn't take that much time. And so I had all this extra time, and I had this space where all I did was work. I was in my office from about 8 in the morning until midnight most nights. And I was like, well, I'm here. i got to do stuff. And I had just, I had just started blogging. Um, we, we, and I was just like, we're just going to we're gonna try a whole bunch of things. So we did the first uh, podcast, we, The Educated Imagination. From there, we did, uh, I did a ton of, of social media work. And I started working with uh, research groups. I organized my first charity event from that office. You know, I did all kinds of stuff. That I, that I never would have done had I been sitting at home because I would have been sitting at home playing video games. Or, or doing that thing that you do when you're a student and you're not studying. You, you, know, you, you sort of break your time into class, work, and free time. And it was this, I, I had this notion that, no, no, no. Grad school is a full-time job. And the more that I treat it like a full-time job, the sort of more I'm going to get out of it. And it was true. I, I, I learned how to manage my own projects better. I learned that 
the only way my own my own projects were going to get done is if I went and did them. I mean, that's the thing. Nobody nobody looks over your shoulder on your thesis. Not in our not in the program that, that I was in. I came into my advisor's office in the first week, and I was like, "Hey, all right, thesis, let's go." He said, "Cool. Step one, go away." Come back in three, in three months. Learn what grad school's like. Come back. We'll start on it then. Think about it. But, so nobody was looking over my shoulder unless I wanted them to. So I had to be the one who looked over my own shoulder. And, and that was sort of the thing that I had resolved to do was develop my work ethic in, 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 in such a way that I could look over my own shoulder. Mm -hmm. It mostly worked. We have podcasts. I'm excited to develop that kind of work ethic because I think that in a lot of ways I'm still at a place in my mind where like work is something that happens rather than something that I do mm -hmm. and every semester I just it just so happens that I produce papers yeah. <laughs> like I don't know I just it's I put this, a tooth, another tooth under my I pillow know, like it's and this the essay fairy visited thing what, what does she the care? They're not her teeth. The cobbler. You put the pieces of paper out <laughs> at night, and you wake up in the morning, and yeah. you have a, a fully finished paper. The exactly. essay elves. The essay yeah. elves the do them for me overnight, and then they write my name on top, and I get the grade. And so I'm really excited to like just develop more work I, ethic. I find, I find that, so as a person whose who's, um, work ethic has lapsed over the past, say, six months, um... Especially like now that I now that I'm work, I, I am I am working full time at a more sort of cerebrally intensive gig, where I solve problems all day. So I my brain is actually tired when I come home. Um, is it's like working out? Like you have to sort of keep doing it. If you get out of the habit of working out, you then then you sort of it's tougher to get back into it. And I'm, finding, I'm finding the same thing with working. Working is it's harder to start writing again and start writing more, because I'm not, like, all I did was write. When, when I wrote my thesis, I wrote three pages a day, good or bad, three pages, and then I stopped. Three pages was the limit. When I hit three pages, you're done, because otherwise, I'm just going to keep writing all day, and then I'm going to feel bad about whatever I did. I, I didn't get managed to get done. But, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I think the best grad students develop and I say that because I had a lot of good role models for it in grad school. I was probably not one of them. I definitely spent a bunch of time napping on the couch in my office. Also, we had a couch. Couch naps are the best. But, um, yeah, no, for me it was, it was that introduction to, to sort of complete autonomy in a space where other people were working and where I could work on my own projects. And then I had fourth level. That's cool. So... Our next topic was strongest grad school memory, which you don't have any yet. I have strongest inclinations about what I think will be my strongest grad school memories. What's your strongest undergrad memory? My strongest undergrad memory, actually, um, believe it or not, was... So when you were talking, um, one of the things that got me really excited, Ryan, um, was when you were talking about uh, the conversations that you have with your peers and how those are so enriching. And I found that for me, the majority of the philosophy that I've learned has been from my classmates talking after class, mm -hmm. um, has been from like the things we talk about while getting beer. Um, beer is an important part of any philosophy degree. Yes, unless you don't drink, and if that's not a part of your life, then that's fine. Too. Even then, during Whenever university, you... I spent so much time, I don't drink a drop, and I spent mm. so much time in bars. Mm. Which I feel like that's something that like deserves critical attention as well just the relationship between alcohol and um, academia. <laughs> alcohol and any kind of big project. <laughs> well, I, always, I always thought that uh, philosophy ended at the, in the bottom of the second glass. Mm, Anything that comes after it, it's, like it's, a, it's a different kind of conversation. <laughs> but for me, the first two glasses was really productive, really interesting conversation. You know what, the, the ones after that are really interesting and stuff, but it felt like... The philosophy stopped at the bottom of the second class. Oh, the inebriati. You come drinking yeah. with me inebriati. It's from a Mitchell and Webb sketch. We'll link it in the it's show funny. notes. Uh, Y'all should come drinking with me. You'll oh, keep dear. talking about interesting things all night long. Oh dear. That sounds really loaded, but what I just mean is that I'm I'm a really like I'm a coherent drunk. I believe. 
Um, my, my best number one um, undergrad memory out of all the amazing conversations I had was um, once in the philosophy lounge having a <coughs> really um, enlightening and insightful and fun and intense debate about Kanye West um, and his lyricism and debates about whether or not um, Kanye West's lyrics um, reflect artistry and if so to what degree and just it was just such a great conversation um, it was myself um, and three other classmates and then one other person joined in and at one point I had looked up the lyrics to um, Diamonds Are Forever and I was reading them out loud and I don't know if you've heard that song but it's pretty vulgar and while I was reading them out loud to the conversation to the group um, one of the profs actually, um, Matt, I think Jim's uh, thesis advisor? As well as Ryan's. And Ryan's. Okay, so Matt walked by, and he stopped and looked at us, and he was like, are you having a philosophical debate about Kanye West? And we were like, uh, yeah. And he's like, good. You know, after class conversations are what philosophy lounges are for. Yep. And then he walked away shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> that, was the he same, just... that was the same look that he gave me when, when I was like, so I want to do my thesis on applied ethics in Dungeons and Dragons. And he went, in, in, like, what? And like, you know, like, intertextual characterized cooperative games. He's like, sure. I can't imagine the look he would have given you. You know what he would have done? He would have been like, he has this hand gesture that he does. I think it's supposed to represent the totality of the universe. It's this gesture where he's like, sure. Like, it just, absolutely. And he looks at the space that he makes with his hands and nods at it. And that is your approval that you can write about whatever topic you suggested. So, so <laughs> my, 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 I finally left, my strongest grad school memory also involves Matt. Um, Matt, in this case, uh, is Matthew Doucette, a, uh, I believe, associate professor. Yeah, at, no uh, tenure. Congratulations. Congrats. And uh, is, I think it was, it was 4.30 in the afternoon, which is, which, for reference, for anyone in the real world, 4.30 is when university professors knock off for the day. You know, 9 to 5 is not really their thing, because classes start at 8.30. So 4.30 is usually, is usually time to go. He's like getting ready to get on his bike. Literally a bike. And uh... Oh, bicycle. Oh. <laughs> I was like, his figurative bike? No, no, like motorcycle. His, his <laughs> actual bicycle. And I, I, I was, I'd been super stressed out. We were organizing the first headshots and I had a ton of papers due and I was behind on everything and I was in that space where you are so stressed about work that you can't work. Preach. And I came into his office, and I'm like, do you have a minute? And he's like, yes. That was Matt's thing, is, is he gave me a lot of space, but whenever I needed to, to uh, whenever I needed a supervisor, I had one. Um, and I'm like, I need you to talk me out of quitting. Gets off his bike, and he's just like, are, are you going to quit? I'm like, I'm not going to quit. I've been at this degree for eight months. I got four months left. I'm going to finish a thesis and graduate. I have come too far. But I want to quit. And I don't know what to do. And I need you to talk me out of quitting. And in like 20 minutes, he had. And I, I, I managed to extend my my deadlines on a couple of papers. And we figured out a sort of work plan for how to get my, my um, one of, a couple of my paper um Perspectives is off the ground, and I was still going to have enough time to run to run headshots and not worry about that, and not let everyone involved in that down. So, yeah, I was just I was juggling too many responsibilities because I had all this autonomy, and so I took on a lot of stuff. And that is apparently a thing that I uh, none of us have learned how to stop doing. So we're just going to deal nope. with it. But yeah, it was it was that notion that if I had needed uh, like. That is what I needed right in, the, in that moment. That was the moment in grad school when I needed the most supervision. I didn't need a lot of guidance on my paper topics. I knew what I wanted to write about. I didn't need a lot of guidance in, in classes and seminars because I knew I needed to go and listen and write things. Um, what I needed was a little push to persevere, and that is the thing that I need the, the, the supervisors, I think, are, are, are there for in that sense. Because there, there is always that point 
in, in undergrad too, where you are so unbelievably burdened or stressed and you cannot figure out how to get out of this hole that you are in. And all you really need is for a person you respect to say, slow down, think clearly and carefully, you can do this. That's really good at helping people de-stuckify. De-stuckify? De yeah, de-stuckify. Matt helped me de-stuckify a couple weeks ago. I went to him crying and I was like, there's so much I have to do and I feel like I'm just crawling and I just want to graduate and go to grad school and I'm so tired. He's like, okay, so what do you have to do? And he <laughs> pulled out a memo pad and wrote down a list of all the things that I was worried about and then um, made them into an ordered list <laughs> and was like, you do these things in this order <laughs> and then let me know how it goes. And I was like, thanks. And I've been doing them in that order. I've nice. actually been sticking to that nice list. Nice to that. Nice so. that. Anyway, Fuck, to you're up. Uh, just, just, let's just keep on the, on the, on the Matthew said love train. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, my story is, uh, involves a different... Outsider! Person, but I, but I, have, I have a funny Matt story. Matt told me that um, if I put TLDR on my thesis, he'd give me 50 bucks. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. Oh, you passed it off? But he, uh, he had one point, I told, we were talking about it, and uh, he offered that if I did that on my thesis and submitted it to be put into the government records, <laughs> he'd, he'd give me 50 bucks to do that. I see that, I see that. But so, what is your strongest grad school so memory? My strongest grad school memory involves somebody else. Um, so, when I was in grad school, I oscillated between thinking that I was smart enough to be there and feeling like I didn't belong there. Uh, no, nobody made me not feel like I belong there, but there was times where I'm just like, this is leaps and bounds ahead of what I am capable of doing. Was it imposter syndrome? Yeah. Or did I think, you feel genuinely unprepared? Uh, well, no, I didn't feel that I, that my undergraduate had not prepared me. It just seemed like in undergrad, I, I was so um, generalist. You know, I liked everything. Everybody else seemed to have that one field that they wanted to work on, and I had no idea what I was doing. And I was trying to make heads or tails, and especially in the pro seminar, the pro seminar on truth, which is what we yeah. did it on, was really difficult to wrap my mind around mm. sometimes. Um, granted, because I was a crappy student, I was also shooting myself in the foot. But this, uh, sometimes I would shoot myself in the foot because right here, just because I couldn't wrap my mind around it. Mm. Mm -hmm. So there would be times, yeah, I, I, I got this, I'm smart enough to do it, I deserve to be here, and there's other times I didn't. And so there was this there's this one person in grad school. So Rachel, mm -hmm. I for some reason had in my mind singled her out. I I thought she was like the best grad student out of all mm. of us, right? I think she was second year at the time. I don't quite remember. Second year PhD. And is the Rachel that I know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's Rachel, intense. Rachel. Yeah, yeah, so I if thought she could crank out work. Yeah. Well, <laughs> was, so, yeah, her work ethic's insane. Well, absolutely. But she was it. just she was just I just thought of her as like the smartest person in the department. Whether or not that was justified or not, for some reason, Rachel was it. And like, I even sometimes antagonized her. Like, just, it, 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 Why are you so good at everything? Yeah, and, and personally, I would like <laughs> challenge her. You know, Stop like, being good at stuff. She complained once about somebody draining the coffee, and I told her, then fucking make some more coffee. You know, like it was just, the, even though she had made the first pot, and then everybody drank it on her. Right? <laughs> you know, like, it, was just, it was just one of those weird, weird things, but I, I looked up to her. Um, and so in the second term of the pro seminar, we, we had written our papers, uh, we were presenting them to each other, and part of the presentation process is uh, you give your paper two weeks out or one week out, and you have to write a response to somebody else's paper. Mm -hmm. Conference style, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, so I got, Ben, if you ever watch this, you know that in first your first year of your PhD, you fucking were terrible at writing papers. <laughs> you were so, your language is so unclear in your you ideas. You suck, Ben. I love you, Ben. I love you, Ben, but your papers at first year fucking sucked. Anyway. That was, that was, that was, that was downright hard. Oh, man. You it suck, was, Ben. I don't even know if you knew what you were talking about, Ben. Anyways, I was reading Ben's paper. I, I just could not understand it. This is one of those moments where I just, I didn't think I was smart enough for it. Mm. So I was trying to write, so the papers were what? 
10 papers to present, sorry, 10 pages to present, so you had to write like a five page response or something like that. And then they had an opportunity to write a one page rebuttal to your response. So I'm reading Ben's paper and I just couldn't crack it. Like I just didn't know what was going on. And I found one tiny little thing about baldness in there. Like, <laughs> like it, it had to do with like degrees, degrees of understanding something. And he was using baldness as a, as a, um, uh, as a metaphor for it. Like he, it was the first time I ever saw Yule Brenner being evoked as <laughs> in, in a paper to make a point. You know, you could be Yule Brenner, Yule Brenner bald, or you could be like Patrick Stewart bald, or something like that. Right? Sure. Yeah, those are both different. Kinds yeah, of bald. different kind of bald. Anyways, I, I, I probably had the paper somewhere in my, in my emails. But um, so I, I found this, and I was super proud of myself, and I wrote, I wrote on it. Right. So Ben presented his paper. I presented my response. He rebutted. That was fine. Then afterwards, we had gone for drinks, and we were drunk. Rachel and me and a few other people, we were drunk. And and this is the, the culmination of the story of my strongest grad school moment. Rachel turned to me, and she said, you know, up until today, like, I was questioning whether or not you deserve to be here. But your response to Ben proved that you deserve to be here. It was like validation. I can't believe she said well, that. Well, she might have, you know what, in my mind. today I thought you were stupid. Okay, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> to, to be fair, I'm probably misremembering it. You were drunk. You were drunk. And Rachel's <laughs> never been that mean. No. Um, so it's entirely possible that I'm like condensing the emotions, like validating in other words what I was feeling. But, <laughs> but to basically to the point of she was unsure whether or not I was cut out for academia. But at that particular moment, by responding to Ben, by being able to like have a laser focus on a particular thing and offer a criticism of, of his argument, she, Rachel told me that she, I had demonstrated to her that I earned or I deserved my you, place you to had, be there. You had the chops. I had the chops. And so for coming from Rachel, that meant a lot, that meant to, a lot me. to me. It was just yeah. like, yes, I have been. I deserve to be here. Now, again, it took me two years afterwards to finish my thesis. And there was a whole host of existential Still. problems with that. But, so, long-winded story, I apologize. That's my strongest grad school memory. Was, yeah, was being, awesome. accept, quite strong. Yeah, being accepted by, by somebody that I looked up to as being, like, uh, uh, the measuring stick to, to measure myself. I feel like... How very Aristotelian of you. Yeah, that is super Aristotelian. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have, with the pre-show... All night we've been making fun of Huck for being a virtuous. So, so. Yeah, it's kind of great. That's yeah. okay. He's keeping Philip a foot company. <laughs> <Ouch>. <laughs> but uh, no, it's interesting that, that that our memories of of grad school and undergrad are all stressful. Oh, like, like Huck and I's nice. memories were both super. We're both super stressful, but at the same time, wow, um, you just read me there. Their just, survival. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're they're they're, they're so so. Would you like some unsolicited grad school advice to finish? Oh out the, yeah, uh, I love when men assume that I need what they have to offer. Completely unsolicited advice. <laughs> Give me wisdom, please. Well, <laughs> empty your cup. <laughs> what does that mean? Because this shit's oh, about to overflow. Oh, okay, okay. Like, be open and receptive to what people have to offer. Well, no, because your cup's about to be full of shit. Oh. But hypothetically, um, Huck, if you had one piece of advice to give a person about grad school, a person who, say, needed that advice, unlike AY. I'm flawless, so I don't know why you're advising me. We're not. We're advising a hypothetical other person. Oh, a hypothetical... Oh, okay. We have listeners. Advice away. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not sure how much of this you already do, um, but definitely... Hypothetical person. Hy hypothetical person. Not me. Um, I probably already do it. Probably. Probably. Um, I would say... Make sure that you seek out those opportunities um, to further yourself outside of what your classes are. Um, so take a stab and submit an abstract for a conference and write that proposal to get money to get funded to go to the conferences and meet other people outside of your department, uh, especially if you're going to a different department. Um, learn to have beers with your instructors and get to know their stories and, and learn what makes them tick and what makes them excited about philosophy, um, especially because there's going to be times when you yourself question why you're there 
for whatever reason. And sometimes it's good to hear the positive stories of other people, and and it can re motivate yourself. Um, and having those invigorating conversations. So I, I will supplement advice. that by saying. Leave your office and campus at least yes. once a week and yeah. do something in the city that you live in because otherwise grad school will eat you. Well, I'm going to be in Seattle, so there's going to be so lots there's going to be tons of awesome stuff to do. Like yeah. I said, a hypothetical person who's going <laughs> Again, to grad school in yeah. Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, Nebraska has universities, right? I, yeah, University of Nebraska. Right, they do a thing with the sports. Yeah, I, I forgot about that as oh. uh, leaving campus is a good idea. Because I, I, I that was why it. I started blogging was yeah. so I had to come up with one interesting thing to do during the week that wasn't mm-hmm. work on stuff because mm-hmm. otherwise I would just have sealed myself in my office yeah. um, and and not have done anything and it would have been unfortunate and I would have not met a lot of cool people. Yeah, I so. think that's a trap that I've seen a lot of my peers get into where they don't leave campus and then they're like, the university there's nothing to life. see. Yeah, and they're like, there's nothing to do in the city, mm-hmm. and I'm like, are you serious? You live here and you haven't found anything to do. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's because you don't leave campus. There's yeah. nothing to do on campus when classes are out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, to summarize, uh, it exploits the wrong word. Take advantage of opportunities, all opportunities outside of class, and do things that that expand your horizons. My piece of advice is sleep whenever you want. <laughs> One of the advantages of being of, of, of sort of having a, a, a grad school type schedule is. Um, you have Lots a lot of, of free time. Oh, you have a lot of open time, and you will invariably not get enough sleep. I believe it was sleep more than you think than you think you should, but not as much as you totally want to. I think that's um, solid and advice. Like, I was highly fortunate to have a couch in my office where if I, in the middle of the day, after having been staring at a screen for like six hours, this assumes that you're not a person. Uh, who enjoys, like, walking or going to the gym or doing something that involves being away from screens and concrete. And I would just go and take a nap. Napping is the way to go. And I would wake up and I would feel better. And I would go back to writing. And I would be like, it is time to go. But that is sleep sleep more. And My sleep whenever you naps, want. My though, is that I don't take naps. I do sleeps. Like, I'll go down and be like, oh, I'm just going to okay. have, like, a, a quick siesta, a quick repose. And I'll wake up five hours later, and I'm like, no, that oh, was no, actually, I, I just I, slept. I ruled, <laughs> that was not a nap. I ruled, my, I ruled my life with alarms during grad school. <laughs> I or can't do alarms. I had, I had alarms that told me when to wake up. I had alarms that told me when to eat food, because otherwise I wouldn't. Because um, I get just, like, I get focused on something, and I just delay it until it's 10 o'clock at night, and I'm like, man, I should eat breakfast. <laughs> so no, I had alarms that told me to eat food so I wouldn't die. Um, that was when I broke up with apples, because I'm in love with the perfect apple. That's a story for another time. Mm-hmm. But I don't even know what that refers to. It, it, I'm in love with the perfect apple. Sadly, many apples are not perfect. Okay. But I do have one bit of good concrete advice, though. Well, hey, you, had, you had a bit of good concrete advice. Give me some concrete. Advice. This, this is one, J- Jim, I'm pretty sure, sure you'll, you'll see, you'll think this is okay. like the advice. double advice. And this is something okay. I, I know that I'm, well, I'm almost 100% positive that you have not experienced that. Start your marking earlier than you think you have to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're right, you're right. Because <laughs> there were plenty of nights when I did not sleep because I left all of my marking to the night before. And they had I, to be in. And they had to be in at 9 a.m. the next morning. Oy. And Orend was very clear. You do not get any extensions. You have everything you need to do this. I have a, and he had a very specific date and time that he was giving it back to the students. Non-negotiable. The students. Well, yeah, you have this a responsibility. Yeah, that's fair students. though. So, I think that's fair. No, it's totally yeah. fair. I'm yeah. not saying Oren was not. He, <laughs> he would have g- taken away the responsibility if I had been upfront with him. So, a concrete piece of advice: whatever else is going on, start, start your marking, your marking. F- earlier than you think you're going to need to. On your marks. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. All right. That's good advice. Anyway, right. congratulations on getting into grad school. Thanks. Fist bump. Thanks. Fist bump. Thanks. Anyway, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm AY. This has been the Concept Crucible Podcast. Stay awesome. Uh, oh, I wanted to do it. Oh, I'm sorry. Stay awesome. <laughs> I feel like that's a good episode. We should have. We should do the slaps. All right. There we nice. go. Oh, that was a good one.